We're going to take a technical break for just a moment because our live stream is not working and we're missing our friends. Melissa is about to do something different. She's going to do a Facebook Live and broadcast at least the sermon. So if you're here, uh, I always tell y'all, please don't be texting while I'm preaching, but if you've got friends that are texting you saying what's going on, text them and say go to Facebook and they can watch at least the sermon on Facebook Live. So we'll let you take just a minute to do that. It may be a while back, but do you remember when you got the keys to the car for the first time? I remember that. It was such an independence. It was so wonderful to to be free and be able to go where I would like to go. But if you're like me, along with those car keys came a little lecture. Did, Did you get that? about responsibility, about ground rules, about where you could go and what you could do and how fast you should drive and and how you should be careful and how you should know how to change a spare tire and you got to have some jumper cables and all this that came with it. But it was still so, so exciting. Now, now in, in my family, we didn't get a car of our own. We had a kid's car, and I had three older sisters, and so I was last to be able to use the car, but fortunately, they had all gone off to college when I turned 16, and my dad liked to buy and sell cars. That just was a hobby of his. He was a pastor, but he really enjoyed buying and selling cars, and so he would trade up every once in a while, and right before I turned 16, he bought a 1972 Mustang Coupe with a little half-leather roof and a 351 Cleveland engine in it. Uh, That puppy would go. I mean, it would just skid out when you touched it. But I also had those words of warning from my folks. Because when my dad gave me my set of keys, I remember the last thing he said was, Nelson, this is not your car. (laughs) This is my car, and it's a privilege for you to drive it, and I letting you drive it and I can take back those keys any day I want well a few months later my dad said I need those keys today and I thought well I've done something wrong and he said no I I just got something I need to do with the Mustang I said okay that's fine he said you can drive the station wagon (laughs) now if you're 16 and you've been driving to school in a Mustang and all of a sudden you drive it in the station wagon it's a whole different experience And I thought, I can't wait to get home and get the keys back to the Mustang. And I got home, and there was no Mustang. Instead, there was a white Ford Maverick with a three-speed on the column. And the thing would not keep running. You had to keep one foot on the clutch and one foot on the brake and one foot on the gas, or it would just cut out on you, and that's three feet. And it was hard to do. But that was the new kid's car. And Dad said, that's it. You should have enjoyed it while you had it, because this is what you got now. And I learned early what stewardship meant. Stewardship means that we don't really own anything. That though we think it might be ours, it's not. Everything that is was created by God and ultimately belongs to God and is to be used for God's purposes. We had to take driver's ed back when I was coming along, not because it was required like it is today to get a license, but because you couldn't afford insurance if you didn't take driver's ed. Do you remember taking driver's ed? They showed you awful movies about car crashes and tried to scare you to death. And they also talked to you about responsibility. They told you about how to drive safely. Is there that kind of thing for us today? Well, of course there is. We who have been given the keys to creation should also listen to the Creator who tells us that it is a privilege to be here on this earth and that we are here that we might not only enjoy it, 
that we might not only be blessed by our earth, but that we might care for it, that we might show our faith in the way we relate to creation. I have a friend named Don Gordon. Don is a pastor, and he's been pastor of several large churches. And Don has been so moved by the need to care for creation that he has started a nonprofit entitled C3, Christians Caring for Creation. I gave you their website. It's just christianscaringforcreation.org. Don says this about creation. Christians should care for creation because God's voice is calling us through creation itself, Holy Scripture, and Jesus himself. Now, I'm going to just steal Don's outline this morning, and we're going to look at those three things as well. If we're going to go to school about creation this morning, the first thing we might do is let creation speak to us and learn from creation. The psalmist said in Psalm 19, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech, night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech, they use no words, no sound is heard from them, and yet their voice goes out into all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. Creation speaks to us. It really does. I had a friend one time that retired, this was several years ago, his name was Tony. I remember talking to Tony and, and I said, how's retirement going? He said, well, actually, I'm really bored. He said, I, I, I miss working. I miss being out with people. And I said, well, what are you doing, Tony? He said, well, I pretty much sit around all day and talk to the dog. To which I said, well, does the dog ever talk back? <laughs> he said, not yet, but when it does, I'll let you know. <laughs> well, animals don't talk to us, or do they? Anybody who has a pet that's beloved knows that animals can speak to us about their love and devotion for us. They let us know when they're hungry. They let us know when they need care. Scripture tells us that creation has a voice. Do you remember Job? Job was blameless and upright, and yet tragedy fell upon him, and he had these folks come and try to help him out to give him some advice and if you remember Job's comforters were not very good comforters uh, they came and they sat for a while and that was good they were just quiet with him but then they opened their mouths and they began to say all kinds of stuff that just was not helpful Job in chapter 12 finally says to one of them when he's asking they're asking him about what's going on he says this, go ask the animals and they will teach you, or the birds of the sky and they will tell you, or speak to the earth and it will teach you, or let the fish from the sea inform you. Job says, I, I don't understand what's going on, but go out and talk to God's creation. Go out and let the presence of God and God's holy creation speak to you. Have you ever had one of those moments where you've been out in nature and God spoke to you through God's wonderful creation? Anytime I'm down, I like to go for a walk in the woods. There's just something about being in God's nature that is calming, that lets us know that God is with us. I, I love to go to the beach, not just because it's a great place to go and you can get good seafood. I love to go and just sit on the sand and look out at the vastness of the ocean and remember how small I am and how big God is. Sometimes we need just to reconnect with creation. I've told you a story about some years ago when I was going through a really, really rough spot in my life. I felt like my life was falling apart and that Things were just changing drastically and not the way I wanted them to change. I went up and I sat on a rock up on the New River. 
and I sat there, and in my despair, I got angry. I got angry not only at my situation, but I got angry at God. And I yelled at God. Why are you letting the sun shine when my world is so dark? Why is the river still flowing? It's just stopped. Things seem to be over in my life. Why do those dang birds keep singing when I have no song in my heart? And I sat there, and God spoke to me. And God said this, Nelson, the sun is still shining. Let it shine into your heart. Nelson, the river is still flowing, and so is my grace. Nelson, the birds are still singing, and there is still a song left for you. Listen to what the world is telling you. Just because it feels like your life may be over, none of my creation has stopped. You're not in charge of this. I am bigger than you. Creation speaks to us and encourages us. But speak, creation also speaks words of warning to us. In Romans chapter 8, Paul says, For we know all of creation has been groaning, groaning with the pains of childbirth right up to the present. Creation itself was longing for the grace of God to come in Jesus Christ. What is creation saying to us today? My friend Don says that he thinks creation is trying to speak to us and is saying these things. Is saying, I I'm hot and I'm getting hotter. NASA tells us that our world has warmed 1.5 degrees since the Industrial Revolution. Two-thirds of that warming has happened since 1975. Well, we might think, well, what's a degree or two? Look at our weather and the major disruptions. Look at what will happen with our crops over the years. Look at what will happen with our seas. We are going to be having more and more environmental refugees because they are going to live in places where they can no longer live. Don says the world is wet and it's getting wetter. It's trying to tell us that because the oceans are rising. The Royal Society tells us that they have risen eight inches since the Industrial Revolution. The ice packs are melting, and it's accelerating year after year after year. Since we started taking satellite pictures of the polar ice caps in 1978, they've lost 40% of their capacity. The world is trying to speak to us. The world is saying, I'm missing my trees. Trees cover 31% of our earth. Trees are literally the lungs of creation. We breathe out carbon dioxide, they breathe it in, and they breathe back out oxygen for us to live. Without trees, we do not live, and yet 50,000 square miles of forest are disappearing every year. That's 48 football fields a minute. Nature is speaking to us, both words of great praise to God, but words of warning. Will we listen to what creation is saying? But it's not just creation itself. Scripture speaks to us about the importance of being stewards of creation. Here in Genesis 1, as we read this beautiful story where God creates all things and creates humankind God says, now, subdue it, or rule over it. What does that Hebrew word there mean for us? It's rada. It's a word that means be in charge of. It doesn't mean to rule as in a harsh way. In fact, it's used again in Leviticus 25, 43, 
when God is talking about those Hebrew children that are so poor that they sell themselves into slavery, God warns and says, do not rule over them ruthlessly, but in fear of God. God's call to take care of one another by being careful, by being loving, is both for how we treat each other and how we treat our world. God puts us, in a way, into creation so that we might be a part of God's ruling over. Our caretaking would be an even better way to say it. The prophets speak about this. Ezekiel, in chapter 34, is talking about Israel's failure to follow God, in particular about the pastoral leadership. And he says, Woe to you shepherds who take care of yourselves. Should not shepherds take care of the flock? You eat the curds and clothe yourselves with wool and slaughter the choice animals, but you do not take care of the flock. And God continues a diatribe against the leaders of Israel. And he says, You have ruled harshly and brutally. Ezekiel warns us, we who have power, that the way we use that with one another and with creation is so, so important. In the second chapter of Genesis, as we see the creation story unfold even more, we see that the Lord God takes the man, he puts him in the Garden of Eden, and he says, work in it, take care of it. There are some master gardeners in our church. There are folks who just do a great job with that. The first one of these folks that I met a long time ago that just really knew how to take care of something was a lady called Miss Llewellyn. She was in my church in Indiana. I went to visit her one day, and she was out in the garden. Now, I knew that Miss Llewellyn was a good gardener because I'd eaten at her table more than once, and boy, would she bring out the vegetables she had this freezer just filled with wonderful produce. And I went out, and she was out there, and she called me down, and she had a hoe, and she was in her 80s at the time, and she was just working herself to death, I thought. And I said, Miss Lewin, be careful. Don't work so hard. And she said, Pastor, don't you preach that God put us here to take care of things like this? She said, I take care of this garden in return it takes care of me. She had this wonderful relationship with nature. She cared for it. She fertilized it. She weeded it. And it gave back produce to her. Billy Graham was asked some time ago on Earth Day what he thought about environmentalism. And what Christians should think about the environment and taking care of God's earth. And he immediately goes to Psalm 24 and he says, The earth is the Lord and everything in it and the world and all who live in it. And then Billy Graham said, When we fail to see the world as God's creation, we end up abusing it. Selfishness and greed take over. And we end up not caring about the environment or the problems we're creating for future generations. He says it's not surprising that some of the world's worst environmental damage has been done by the old atheistic regimes of Eastern Europe. In other words, Billy Graham said, taking care of God's world is part of our faith. You see, when we talk about Christian environmentalism, we're not talking about science as far, much as science is important to us. We're not even talking about self-preservation. We're talking about the call of God to care for God's creation. You see, we should listen and learn to Jesus as well. In the book of John, John starts out and says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and through him all things were made, and without him was nothing made that has been made. Right up front, John says, 
Jesus is also the God of creation. From the beginning, Jesus has loved the world, the earth. Look at the teachings of Jesus. Parable after parable, he talks about nature. Jesus is walking along to the disciples and he says, Consider the lilies of the field, how they don't toil and yet they are beautiful in God's sight. Consider the birds of the air and how God cares for them. And God cares for you as much. Jesus on a sunny day says that God's grace comes down like the sunshine. And on a rainy day, he says God sends the rain on the just and the unjust. Jesus compares God to a shepherd who is taking care of sheep. Jesus says that he is like a living water that wells up in our hearts and our minds so that we might not thirst. He talks about seeds, and he talks about weeds, and he talks about wheat, and he talks about fish, and he talks about trees. And as he goes into Jerusalem, when he's going to give his life for us, and they're shouting, Hosanna, and the leaders say, tell them to be quiet. Jesus says, if they were quiet, even the rocks would cry out. For creation recognizes its creator. Jesus tells us that we are to care for the poor and the destitute. In the Sermon on the Mount, he gives us an ethic to live by. And he talks to us about caring for the least of these. Part of that is caring for creation. Why? Because we all live here on this earth together. Because climate change affects the poor sooner and more severely than anyone else. It is those who are most at risk that are in the poorest areas already. It is those who don't have wherewithal just to simply move someplace else that are going to be caught up in this. We can be a part of changing things. Or we can see the worst environmental damage and disaster ever. In 2011, the National Association of Evangelicals published a 29-page document it was entitled, Loving the Least of These, Addressing a Changing Environment. And, and where did they go for their evidence that it is Christians and evangelistic Christians should be leading in this? To Matthew 25, where Jesus says, Truly, I tell you, whatever you did for the one of the least of these brothers and sisters, you did for me. These leaders of evangelistic movements realized that this is part of our call as Christians. That the way we treat the world reflects the way that we love one another. When I was helping with Boy Scouts when my son was that age, we went on a lot of trips. On every trip, we would talk about this little saying they had. It's called, leave no trace. We say, now, whenever we go there and we leave there, it shouldn't even look like we've been there. I remember one day when we went to the Grand Canyon and we were walking down into the canyon and we turned around and a couple of our boys were carving their names into some rocks with their pocket knives. Our scout master ran over and confiscated the knives immediately. And he gave them the leave no trace talk. And he said, you see these folks coming down the trail behind us? Do you think they want to see this? When you came down, you saw the beauty of what God put here. And now they're going to see it scarred by what you just did. Those boys, I hope, learned that lesson that day. And you might say, well, we would never do such. But the way we live our lives determine whether or not we are leaving no trace or we are scarring God's creation. You see, this sermon calls for a response. To practice what we are learning today through creation and through Scripture and through Christ himself. You know that I taught school for a very short time, but I really enjoyed it. 
I enjoyed the camaraderie of the other teachers as well. One of the teachers that talked with me was Mr. Cotter. Bless his heart. When your name's Mr. Cotter, they all make jokes and sing that song about Welcome Back, Cotter. He liked to joke around, too. When he gave a test, across the top of his test, he didn't write test or examination. He wrote learning opportunity. <laughs> there was learning opportunity one, two, three, all the different tests he gave. And he would snicker, and they go, what do you mean learning opportunity? He said, you've got an opportunity to learn what you know and what you don't know. And then we'll go back and talk about what you need to learn again. We have a learning opportunity today about creation. True or false? Does creation show God's love and power and therefore we should respect it? I hope you would say true. True or false? Does scripture affirm our call to care for creation as God's stewards of where God has placed us? I hope you would say true. True or false, does Jesus teach us to love our world and all that is in it? I hope you will say true. We are called to care for creation because it is a part of our faith. This is not about right or left or political or science or any of that stuff. This is about our faith. This is about our scriptures. This is about our call our call as people of faith to care for creation. There are all kinds of different Bibles out there that you can get that emphasize different aspects of Scripture. There's even one out there called the Green Bible. Maybe you've seen a copy of it. If you get a Green Bible, all the words that talk about the earth are printed in green. If you flip through it, it's just filled with green. In fact, there are over a thousand scripture references to creation or the earth. There are only 490 that talk about heaven. What do you think that might mean to us? Do you think it might mean that God wants to remind us again and again that though heaven is important and one day we long to be there, that right now God has put us here and said, tend to this earth. What is it that I'm wanting to do? I'm wanting you to care for our earth and advocate for creation. I'm wanting you to tithe. Now you said, now pastor, we read that article you wrote and you're going to be talking about stewardship for seven weeks and you told us you're not going to talk about money till the last sermon. And you just said the word tithe and we knew it, we knew it, we knew you couldn't stand it. You'd have to say it. I'm not talking about tithing of our money. We will get there. I'm talking about what Lutheran theologian scholar David Rhodes has suggested. He suggests something called an environmental tithe, which is almost a reverse tithing. He says, we as Christians perhaps could reduce our electrical consumption by 10% to recognize that we need to give back to our creation um, through what we do with what we consume. That we could reduce our water use, that we could reduce the amount of trash we make, that we could produce our carbon, that footprint that they talk about. By 10%, that all of us could be a part of caring for creation. I read that this week and I thought, now that's a strange way to tithe, but it makes sense to me. God created us just like He created Adam and Eve, and God put us in a beautiful place and said, Take care of it, my beloved children. This morning we're going to move to a time of invitation. We, of course, are opening the doors to our church to those who might want to receive Christ as their Lord and Savior. For those who might want to become a part of this church, this morning I'm actually going to come down front if you would like to come forward and make any commitment or decision. I would invite you to do so as James comes and sings for us.